Good morning, boys and girls, moms, dads, caregivers, and monarch enthusiasts. Welcome to today's Monarch Monday program. I'm Miss Megan from the Perry Hall branch, and I'm joined by Mr. Dominique from the Woodlawn branch. And it is our absolute pr pleasure to welcome Miss Adrienne Hubbard, um, who is a local educator and monarch enthusiast. And she is here today to tell us all about the monarch life cycle, how we can help the monarch, and just generally give us a lot of good, fun information about the monarchs. Um, I do want to give a special shout out to the friends of the Perry Hall Library for their generous support and sponsoring of today's wonderful program. So I'll just hand it over to Miss Adrian at this point. Hi, Miss Adrian. Hi. Hi. Hello, everybody, and thank you for tuning in. Um, so my name is Adrian Hubbard, and I'm, I am actually an ESOL teacher with Baltimore City Public Schools. And a few years ago, I attended a teacher um, monarch workshop at Ledoux Gardens uh, at the Butterfly House there. If you haven't been to Ledoux Gardens, that would be a really nice place to go, and you can go and be outside safely. I did find out that the Butterfly House did have to close, um, because of the virus, because a lot of people were coming, but um, it will reopen again at some point, and I have some pictures to show, show you. So all of the pictures I'm about to show you, I took myself, except for a couple where I, I took a picture of a poster. So what I'm showing you right now is, is a poster. Um, I found, I just, after I took this workshop, I found it so fascinating that I really wanted to share it uh, with as many people as possible. Um, so you're gonna learn all about the, how the monarch butterflies grow and change and how they migrate uh, and how to take care of them if you choose to try that at home. Uh, and then what we can do in our own yards and even at library gardens to help support them, to give them what they need. Um, we are also going to stop and, and try to answer any of your questions. Okay, so right here in front of you is the entire metamorphosis all in one place. So metamorphosis is when it changes from egg to caterpillar to chrysalis to adult butterfly. So it goes through four stages. That is called a complete metamorphosis. I have lots of pictures to show you of each one of those stages. If you have a question about how does it make its chrysalis, then you might want to wait until we get to that part of the program. Okay. This is a picture of the Monarch Teacher Network Group um, from, I think it was last summer. So even though I took the workshop three years ago, I go there every year to help out. Unfortunately, this summer it was canceled because of uh, COVID, um, but uh, it will hopefully return next year. And this is at Ledoux Gardens. They have a beautiful meadow surrounding the gardens and you can see the, some flowers in the meadow and adult monarchs drink nectar for their food. So the meadow provides uh, the food that they need. Here's a picture of the butterfly house which um, is almost like an outdoor space. It just has a screen to keep out some of the predators of the, uh, the butterflies. It also doesn't just have monarchs, it has many different kinds, but they're all uh, kinds that are local to Maryland. The volunteers there go out in the meadow and they're trained on how to find the eggs, the caterpillars and the adults, and then they bring them into the butterfly house. This protects them from some of the predators that, that eat them. There's a picture of the inside of the butterfly house. Oh, wow. They say that the monarch is a gateway bug to getting addicted to other insects and learning all about them. So um, I do, uh, I wanna encourage you to learn about all insects and all animals, but today we're gonna to focus on the monarch, but there's many other um, amazing creatures and, and different kinds of butterflies that they care for in there, as well as moths. Um, last year, I had the privilege of giving a workshop at the Finksburg branch of the Carroll County Public Library, and that was just a picture from that one. I did a webinar for them a few days ago, so um, 
in the background, I have my slide of the um, pupa, and there's a thing called the pupa dance where the pupa gyrates around like that. So we were doing the pupa dance. And um, they have a native plant garden right outside the Finksburg Ranch. And I'm not sure if any of the Baltimore County Public Libraries have this, but I would be very excited to see that. And maybe uh, at some point I could help with that. Um, uh, when we released the adult butterfly at the end of the presentation, we, we knew that it would go and have the shelter and the, the, sh the food that it would need. We didn't get a picture of the butterfly it flew away so fast. So that is the native plant garden outside the Finksburg branch. Also last summer, I had the privilege of uh, presenting at the Lock Raven branch of the Baltimore County Public Library. Um, and they have a lot of uh, some forest around the library there. And so we released the adult monarch up into the trees. Um, I also was able to bring some milkweed plants um, and eggs and caterpillars to the Finksburg branch and they put it in a, a large netted enclosure in the library out where the public could see it and uh, they were able to successfully take care of it until it became a butterfly and then they released it. So in this picture you could see the caterpillar is hanging upside down in what they call J shape if you reverse it, it would be a J. Um, and that's right before it makes its chrysalis. And of course, the librarian took a bookend <laughs> and put it in to help uh, to have, so once, so what happened was the, the plant started to get too old and the chrysalis was hanging from the leaf of the plant, which is getting too old. So they, um, I believe they cut the chrysalis very carefully off of the leaf and then reattached it, uh, or, well, actually you see the old leaf there, reattached it to the bookend so that we have something stable to hang from. The only thing they should have done differently is put something soft on the bottom just in case the butterfly were to fall from the chrysalis so it would not injure its wings. And also it needs something sticky to climb on. So metal is not a good surface. So something like netting or paper towel or something like that. Okay, so we, do we have any questions uh, at this point yet? Uh, so far, I think people have been holding their questions apart from the technical ones. So oh. we are good. Well, I want to make sure that we answer all the questions. Um, okay, so Miss Megan, I know you've been studying this. Do you know what, whether this adult butterfly is a male or female? I do know because I have watched one of your previous lectures. This is a male monarch. And how do you know that? Ah, I'm so glad you asked. Uh, I can see the uh, small, almost tear-shaped black dots that are on the, the lower quarter or lower half of the wings of the monarch, and I believe that is what distinguishes the male from the female. Very and good. Yes, um, there are two black dots on the hind wings of the male monarch butterfly, and the females do not have them. In addition, the black lines or veins on the wings of the male are thinner than the female. Oh, I did not know that. And they always, oh, in addition, they also, the males also have some little things that project off of the abdomen there. Okay, so uh, Ms. Beggy, you wanna try again? Is this a male or a female? Okay, I've got this. It's a female. And how do you know that? by the absence of the little two black dots. And also, now that you've pointed it out, those uh, lines or veins on the lower rings, wings do appear thicker. So that's a good tip. Right, if you had a Sharpie marker, you would need like a medium thickness to draw this one. Very good. Um, one thing I forgot to mention is just how much fun it is to learn about the monarchs and um, it's just they're just so beautiful you just have to love them okay and so let's give our audience a second to think whether this is a male or a female okay if you said male that is correct you see the two black dots on the hind wings 
Very good. Now, you, in this picture, you also notice it almost looks like uh, the butterfly has hair on its body in the middle here. Those are actually scales. Uh, we know that fish have scales, the snake have scales, but a lot of people don't realize that butterflies actually are covered in tiny little scales all over their wings and body. And one reason you should never touch their wings is because a little, little some of the scales fall off every time uh, anything touches them. And that oh, is them. I've seen that like powder almost. Yeah, it's like powder. Okay, so the audience can think to themselves, is this a male or a female? If you said female, good job. There's another female. Um, I've, take so I've taken so many pictures because they always look a little different. And every time I take a picture and look at closely at the picture, I feel like I learn more about the butterflies. There's a male. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> so you notice the underneath of the wings is much paler and it is a little hard to tell which gender it is. Um, I would guess this one might be a female just because the lines look so thick, but it is a little hard to tell. So, and you can see that um, I allow it to perch on my hand because it does not hurt it to, uh, for it to perch on you because I'm not touching the end of the scales. And you can even see the ends of the feet have almost like little hooks on them. So this monarch is on a plant called swamp milkweed. You may have heard that um, in order to help the monarchs that we should plant milkweed plants. And that's because that it's the only plant that the female monarch would lay its eggs on and then the egg will hatch and the caterpillar will come out and it will eat and eat and eat those milkweed leaves. Milkweed is the only plant that the caterpillars will eat. Um, and there really isn't enough milkweed around. So this plant with the pretty uh, pink flowers is called swamp milkweed. And that's one of the native milkweeds that you can plant. And it looks very pretty in your garden or your yard too. Um, so I know Dominic, I was teaching you about the tongue, the adult monarch's tongue and how it drinks its nectar. Do you remember the word for that? Oh man, I think it was one of those key words. Was it kerbosis, I think? Almost. So, Ms. Megan, you know it? Um, well, only because Dominique got so close to it that triggered my memory. I think it's proboscis? Proboscis, yeah. It, it looks like proboscis, but um, apparently you, you don't pronounce the C. So, <laughs> um, and you see it looks like a straw. So, it's sticking its uh, proboscis right down into the center of the flower to drink that nectar. So, once they become adults, they, they have a liquid diet. They can't chew anything that they can drink. Wow. And there's another one showing the proboscis. So, if you see a butterfly doing that, you know it's, it's having lunch. Oh, um, Miss Adrian, I think I saw a question pop up. Yep. Do, you, do you know what size are the typical butterfly? I mean, monarchs. Ah, the exact size. Um, ah, I will check one second. Stumped I have the many professor. Books. <laughs> I have many books, but I also have my handy pocket reference. Nice. So when you have things like this in your house, you can find out very quickly because it has the size. So three and three quarters inches. Three and three quarter inch. But they're not all exactly the same size. They, there's a little variation. So they're fairly large. And they are bright orange to tell predators, look, see me, notice me, and I'm poisonous, so don't eat me. Um, but however, they're only poisonous to vertebrates, so birds don't eat them generally, but all kinds of other insects do, praying mantises and spiders. And um, so a, they, a lot of them do get eaten. I've taken some, I'm showing you some other adults before we get into the egg and the caterpillar and pupa stage, um, because it, it tells you a lot about their life and what they go through. Do you notice anything about this butterfly that looks different? You guys? How, Megan? Hmm. You know, one of its wings looks a little bit damaged. Mm-hmm, and anything else? It's a male. 
Yes. <laughs> Well, some of our audience members might have noticed that it's also faded, looks faded, doesn't it? Some of it's, it's lost some of its colors. That's because a lot of its scales have fallen off. So maybe it's been through lots of rainstorms and wind. Uh, maybe it's a little older. Uh, so it, it, you could tell it's a little older. It's been through some things. Maybe it just migrated here uh, and it's just been flying a lot. So. However, they amazingly can keep flying, even this one here that was, this is, these are butterflies from my own yard, um, missing, you know, huge chunks of their wings. They're still able to fly. Wow. That's amazing. Okay, so um, Dominique, how many legs does an insect have? At least this one in the photo, right? Well, what did you learn in school about insects and how many legs they're supposed to have? <laughs> they got many legs, I mean, especially with like those little tarantulas, but it looks like four. It does look like four, but it's supposed to be six. So what's going on? Hmm. All right. What happened is that some butterflies have two tiny legs that are right tucked right under their face. If you look really carefully, you see these little bumpy things sticking out right between its wow. eyes. Those are actually to its front two legs. So it does have six legs. You just can't see the other ones very well. They're like T-Rex legs. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> but those two legs um, do a very special function. So I will tell you that in a moment, a little later. Okay. So. This is a male and female who are mating, and um, this is inside the butterfly house a few years ago. So they're safe in there. After they mate, the female goes off to lay its eggs. And of course we know it needs to find milkweed plants or it won't be able to lay its eggs. So this is a picture of my schoolyard. I teach, as I said, in Baltimore City, William Packer Elementary down in Southeast Baltimore. And I started a milkweed patch there. And this is one of my first graders who I taught how to carefully look. You can see he's take, taken the tip of the leaf and he's looking under it really carefully. Because if you read The Very Hungry Caterpillar, you know they only lay one egg per leaf. And usually it's on the bottom of the leaf so that the predators won't find it. So he's looking mm -hmm. for um, monarch eggs. Now I have several pictures I took of female monarchs laying eggs. Now I had to do this for several years before I was able to get all these photos. So I was always, always looking for the perfect photo. So she presses her abdomen to the underside of the leaf, but sometimes she lays them on the top of the leaf. And I did not know this until I observed it myself. She even will lay uh, the eggs on the flower buds. Uh, this is all the milkweed plant though. Oh wow. And here she's laying it on the seed pod. And then you can see in this photo, this is the one with the missing wing part again. And she's probably at the very end of her life and just laying her last batch of eggs. And you can see the leaves are kind of yellowing because it's late late summer, early fall. Um, and this is another reason we need to um, take care of our yards and, and as well as library gardens and keep those, try to keep those plants going and keep, keep them growing late into the summer and fall season too, so that the monarchs have what they need. Okay, so at the end of this video clip, you'll see the female press her abdomen to the leaf and lay her egg. And it's in slow motion, so you can really kind of see how they fly. Wow. And again, that is milkweed, swamp milkweed in my yard. Okay, what do you think that is? 
Megan, what would you, you, I'm sure you know what that is on the leaf. I'm going to go out on a limb. I'm going to call it an egg. Very good. Is there anything you noticed about this egg? It's kind of, it's a little pointier than I was expecting. It's pointy on the end and that makes it pretty easy to identify that it's a monarch egg. Because when you're hunting around in, on milkweed for eggs, there are lots of little white spots that you might notice. Um, but it's not going to be the egg unless you see that pointy end. So it kind of looks like a football. Yeah. There's another picture. Okay. Oh, looks like we have another question from the audience. Wanted to know how did that happen, at least with the, the flight, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, right? The video of, of the butterfly flying that I just showed you? Right. How did it happen? Oh, okay. I see. It looks like an egg. Okay. How did the egg happen? <laughs> How did the egg happen? Um, so some animals lay eggs. Some have live births and some lay eggs. So the male and the female mated. A female became pregnant with eggs in her abdomen. And then she flew to the leaf and pressed her abdomen on the leaf and the egg came out. And also the egg has a sticky substance, so it won't fall off the leaf. Okay, and here you see a black dot on the egg, which is the baby caterpillar's head. It's the head of the baby caterpillar, and you know it's about to hatch. And you see my fingertip for scale. They're tiny. Wow. So the uh, caterpillar is in its first stage where the head is black and the body is just a pale green, no stripes yet, no antennae. And it's going to have its first meal, which is the eggshell. Now it has graduated to solid food or leaf food, and it's munching on the milkweed leaf. But it's so tiny that if it just makes tiny little holes, because it's trying to cut off the flow of that milky white sap that's poisonous, that's how the butterf adults become poisonous to birds by eating, as caterpillars, eating that milky white sap from the milkweed, which is poisonous. So try not to get too much of that poison in its body by eating a circle around it to stop the flow, and then it's going to eat the green leaf in the center of that circle. That's amazing. So you can see the sap here. Um, you can see this caterpillar looks different, doesn't it? So how did the caterpillar change like that? Megan, do you know? Um, honestly, I'm, I'm not quite sure the nutrients of the milkweed, but I don't know how. So it shed its skin. Ah. And it's, that is its new skin. So it molted and it does that four times. Wow. So you can see now when it's in its second stage of uh, being a caterpillar, it's called the second instar. It looks a lot different, right? It has stripes, it has antennae, and it does. It has legs that you can see too in another picture. Um, okay, so then it has to keep growing because all it does is eat and eat and eat and eat and eat. That's the caterpillar's job, just to eat and get fat and grow because once it becomes a pupa, it's not gonna eat for about 14 days. So here you see it, it has just shed its skin again. That black uh, crumpled up stuff is the old skin. And on the left is the head plate. It also sheds its head plate because its head gets bigger. I like to joke that that's its COVID mask. <laughs> You can see the antennae are wiggly too because it's still wet. It just came out of its new skin. And sometimes it will eat the old skin and that gives it ex extra toxins from the plant to make it more poisonous. Hmm. And if you are, let me go back to this for a second. If you are raising them at home, you wanna make sure you don't touch them during this time. And it's better not to touch the caterpillars at all, but they're very um, vulnerable right after they shed their skin. You can see this one looks bigger. You see the antenna are longer. It has those Fred Astaire feet with the, um, the what looks like white socks and black shoes there in the middle. Um, 
And this one could be in getting fairly soon ready to pupate. Um, now, we know that insects are supposed to have six legs, right? Remember that, Dominique? So um, what's going on? Now, before it didn't have enough legs. Now it has too many legs. Well, the front legs, there, it's hard to see all three, but there's um, three on each side right behind the head. And those are the true legs. So it does have six true legs and they have pointy sort of claw-like endings. The other ones are called pro legs and they do help it to walk and get around, but for some reason they're not considered real legs. Um, if you um, learn, if you get the training and you learn how to do this at home, um, you can integrate a lot of other cross-disciplinary skills. Like here you see, you, I'm measuring the caterpillar. <laughs> so you, you learn measurement skills. Now, does any, does, uh, Megan, do you know which one is the head of the caterpillar and which one is the end? That is a tough call. Um, I'm going to go with the slightly longer antennae at the bottom, maybe being the head. Excellent choice. Yes, very good. So this is, this is a trick question because it's actually upside down. <laughs> and same thing here, right? You can see the antennae are longer uh, at the head than at the back. You can also see that the true legs with the pointy ends are right behind the head. And also it's taken a bite out of the leaf here. Okay, so and this one, I just thought it, the antenna looked like ears. It almost looked like my pet, you know, like it was listening to me. Um, it doesn't really have a great sense of hearing though when it's uh, a caterpillar or an adult. So I sort of forgot to mention, like why would we want to even care about monarchs in the first place? And one is that the, they do this amazing migration um, that almost no other insects do. Uh, so the only reason we see monarchs at all in the state of Maryland is because they're able to migrate in the winter because they would not be able to survive the winters we have here. Um, they can't really fly below the temperature of 55 degrees. So they have evolved this ability to know how to migrate to central Mexico before it gets too cold and survive through the winter there and then come back as far as the Gulf states and lay eggs and then the next generation comes and then they lay eggs and the next generation comes further north and they lay eggs and the next generation comes up to Maryland. There's some debate about how many generations, is it two or three or four? I think it's, a, it's maybe around three. Um, so that is to say we, we can help them by rearing them at home, but only if we do it correctly. So if you have not had the training um, and aren't sure, it's probably better just to leave them in the wild. And it's a little sad though, because a lot of them do get eaten by predators. But um, so when I learn more about uh, the importance of like rearing them outside instead of indoors, I try to leave them outside on the plant as long as possible. So here's one that's really large and then I cut the plant and put it in a jug of water and let the caterpillar just stay on the plant and I put the whole plant in an enclosure. I'm going to show you pictures, but it's much more interesting kind of to see them crawling around outside on the actual plant. So here's what it might look like. This is uh, from my yard and you can see how they move around. Uh, yes, and Adrian, while that's playing, we had two questions from the audience. So one is from one of our attendees, Treasure, who wanted to know what training you did for the caterpillar. And another person wanted to know what are some of the examples of the predators that may prey on the caterpillars. Oh, great questions. 
So my training was basically um, the workshop that I went to with Modern Teacher Network. It's a three-day workshop. And that's, that's for teachers, but librarians also get to go. And also, they gave it, us this manual and everything you want to know about um, taking care of the caterpillars and the eggs and the adults is all in this book. Also, there's a lot of good websites, and I have a slide uh, with those websites. So this um, broadcast is going to be recorded and posted, so you'll be able to go back to that later. Um, and I can also send those to, to Megan, and, and um, you'll be able to access them. Um, and then some of it I learned through trial and error and my own observations. So you know what? Even if you're not a real scientist, you are a scientist if you are observing things and taking notes and then and really noticing you know what what you're seeing so a combination of getting the right information and then observing um uh and i also have friends i there's a, a lepidopterist society um that has monthly meetings or or meet the virtual now but there's a, a community of people who do this too then we share information there's some face, facebook groups too Yeah, I'm going to skip that one. Okay. Um, so at one point on my dining room table, I had something like 15 enclosures of, uh, filled with uh, monarchs in the different stages of its metamorphosis all going on at the same time. Uh, so it was quite a lot of work. Um, it, you really do have to be prepared to spend a lot of time on it if you do it. Um, and then the recent research says that you, ideally, you would be doing it outside and the enclosures would be outside, especially if uh, it is late summer and fall, because that is the generation that's going to migrate to Mexico. And raising them outdoors exposes them to the, the, the humidity, the light and dark, the natural cycles of light and dark, and that helps them. Um, so I'm showing you this, that it's not necessarily always the right thing to do. They, um, the other thing is if you don't have a lot of milkweed plants, you have to conserve and ration. So um, I would cut off, you know, just the amount of leaves uh, that I would need each day for each enclosure and put them in there. And the caterpillar is just resting on the leaves eating. You can imagine eat your favorite food, maybe it's a big pizza, and your job is just to lie there and eat it for two weeks. <laughs> That's all you have to do. The only thing is, the harsh reality is that everything poops. <laughs> so I had to clean the these enclosures every day, sometimes more than once every day. So the official word for caterpillar poop is frass, F-R-A-S-S. -S. So we'll say that word now, frass. It sounds a lot better, right? So that's at the end of a day of the caterpillars eating. That is what more crap than I would have expected. <laughs> it's a lot, yes. Huge. Um, it looks like so, we have another question from the audience. Someone wanted to know when do the monarchs come to Maryland? They used to see them in the California Bay Area a lot. Oh, yes. Excellent question. So the monarchs that are in California are a whole different group. Um, the Western monarchs, west of the Rockies, they don't migrate to Mexico. Um, and they, their patterns are a little different. So I don't, I'm not very knowledgeable about them. Um, with, in Maryland, we usually would be seeing a lot more monarchs right at this time of year. Um, but everything is late this year, possibly because our spring was cooler than normal. Um, but I uh, went on the Monarch Watch, uh, one of the websites, I think it was monarchwatch.org, and they said that the numbers are looking okay. Um, it, it seemed a little scary not to be seeing them, but um, I've had five monarch sightings in my yard so far, and I haven't seen any caterpillars yet. This summer I had other obligations. I took a break from rearing them. Um, now, some people get the eggs and caterpillars from breeders. Um, I just talked to a neighbor yesterday when I went on a walk and she had gotten um, something like 50 eggs from some woman in Pennsylvania. And I said, well, just double check that the way that they're breeding them is not actually introducing diseases. So sometimes breeders have too many in the right, wrong conditions. Uh, so whenever possible, it's better just to use the ones that you, you find. Um, 
and you'd be surprised. If you look around, you can find patches of milkweed um, along the roads and fields, um, and maybe just put it out there on social media. Um, your neighbors may have some. So there's ways to find it. If uh, things were different, I, I would, um, hopefully next year, I, maybe if the library would like me, um, I can come and do a live workshop and I'd be happy to bring milkweed plants or um, maybe work with the friends of the library to start milkweed patches in, in the, around the library. I would love to do that. We would love to have you, absolutely. Yay. Okay, oh, uh, Ms. Adrian, oh, we have uh, another question. Oh, uh, we have a question about the predators. Uh, so I am not an expert on the predators, but as I said, um, the vertebrates, the birds usually do not eat the adults because they have the toxins in them. And the caterpillars also have the toxins. However, the invertebrates, a lot of them will eat them. So praying mantids, um, spiders, even ants, you know, when the, the tiny eggs are so tiny. Uh, so all kinds of insects. They have a lot of predators. Their chances of uh, getting through the metamorphosis um, is about one in a hundred out in the wild. Yeah. Did you have another question, Megan? Or were you reminding me about that question? Um, I think a new question had popped up uh, about why do they have stripes? Um, well, the those are actually veins and I believe there's fluid that goes through them and it also it's, they don't have bones but it because they have an exoskeleton but I believe it provides some support and structure for their wings to make them stronger. Makes sense. Um, so this is uh, my basement um, so the, I think the next summer I turned my ping pong room in my basement into the, the monarch rearing area. So they're actually on the plants on this. Okay, then I wanted you to see what does it look like when the caterpillars are actually eating. They don't have teeth, but they have mandibles and they're really good at chewing. So if you're hungry right now, you might want to go grab a snack. This is going to make you hungry. <laughs> um, I don't, the, for some reason I don't have sound on this, but the sound is just like a soft chewing sound. Like, so everybody can just go like this right now. Very good. <laughs> so, it's kind of like eating corn on the cob. It's just chew, 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 chew. And you see there, it's true legs in the front, right behind the head, the long antennae. You can tell that is the front of the caterpillar. There you go. Ms. Adrian, do you think this would be a, a good moment for a quick brain break so we could stretch? Oh, yes, I sure have been talking a lot. I know that. Um, well, one of the things that the um, monarch does when it gets its wings and it, the wings dry off is it tries out its wings by going up and down. So we could try that. And I have my butterfly shirt on here. We get oh. up and we can try, we can try our wings up and down, up and down. Woo! <laughs> Excellent. I like your flapping company. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. All right. Excellent. All right. Brain breaks are good. So that's just, um, I was telling you that once the caterpillars are fat, I call them fat cats. <laughs> once I have some fat cats, um, I know they're going to pupate soon. And um, the chances of me finding where their chrysalids are outside are practically zero. I've only found like two chrysalids outside. They find some special places where it's hard to find them. So I bring them in when the fat cats are fat, they're about to pupate and then they pupate on the plant. So you hear me say chrysalis and pupa, it's the same thing. Um, but a moth does not have a chrysalis. A moth has a cocoon. So what um, he, Eric Carl wrote in The Very Hungry Caterpillar was not quite right there. Uh, that's because he was giving, paying homage to his grandfather because his grandfather used to say cocoon. Um, so moths make cocoons, butterflies make chrysalids, but they're all pupas. So they're just a protective case 
inside which the caterpillar transforms into a butterfly, grows its legs and wings and its body. So you see that out of the end of this caterpillar, there's some white stuff where it's attaching itself to the leaf. All right, so Megan, what do you, why do you think it's doing that? What do you think it's getting ready to do? I think it's making its little chrysalis stem there. Yeah, it's making, that, it's making a silk mat. Like a spider spins a silk web, it spins a silk mat that's sticky and will um, be a, like an anchor it to there. And, we, and it can, then it can drop down. Imagine if you were a caterpillar and you had to just stick yourself by your end to the ceiling and then you just had to fall down. Just hope that you don't crash down on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> but I've never looks seen like, one fall. Looks like we got a couple more questions coming in. Treasure would like to know what is a cocoon? So a cocoon is the pupa of a moth. Um, and unlike the, cater the butterfly chrysalis, the cocoon is external to the body. So it's like if you get cold and you put on your coat, you know, it's something you put on over yourself. Whereas you're gonna see the video, um, it's hard to explain, you really have to see it. So I'm gonna show you the, uh, how the monarch caterpillar makes its chrysalis. So it's getting ready to pupate because it's about to hang. It's still kind of curled up, right? Curled up tight. And when it's really ready, it starts to hang limply and you see the tentacles, um, the antennae just hanging limply. And then it's time to get grab that camera because you're, about to see the chrysalis formation. That's just showing you, for those of you who are interested in ever trying this yourself, and if you have a lot of milkweed, that is the kind of setup I see it's cute right on the plant. All right. Okay, so this is where um, I use the time lapse uh, feature on my iPhone, and I got the fast motion version of the chrysalis formation. So what you're about to see is it's shedding its skin for the final time. It looks like something is coming on, on the outside of it, but it's actually just like unzipping itself. Like if you have a jacket and you unzip it, it's taking it off and the insides become the outsides. Oops, I meant. Whoa. Wow. I have another one. So how long do they fully take the transform? You're gonna see it in real time. Sweet. Oh, wow. So remember I mentioned the pupa dance? So you <laughs> saw that at fast motion too. And then you see that there's a black thing called the cremaster that attaches to the silk mat to help it hang. Yeah, it is very cool to see that happen. Okay, and here it is in real time. It takes about, I think it's about a minute and a half. Wow, only a minute and a half to turn itself inside out? <laughs> 45 seconds, actually. Whoa. So the, it starts to open up behind its head and then it just wriggles out of its old skin for the final time. That is like a magician's trick. That's amazing. It can't see what it's doing, but it knows what to do. So this is about after about two weeks of being a caterpillar. The whole metamorphosis takes about one month for the monarch. Excuse me. Wow, and you, you did this in your own house, right? I think it took me a couple of years to finally catch this on camera. It would be like I turn around to do something and 
I missed it. Yeah, that process is so much faster than I would have thought. <laughs> So now it's starting to pupa dance. And what's, what it's doing is trying to get that black stick, you can see at the top, it's threading it through the silk mat in multiple ways to really secure it. Because it's got to hang, up, hang like that for up to 14 days as it transforms into the butterfly, the adult stage. And then you'll see this, the old skin fall. Wow. You can't see. Oh, there it goes. So, Ms. Adrian, I'll just mention we've got about eight minutes left. Oh, my goodness. I know. Time flies. I think we can go over a little bit. I don't think there's anyone directly behind us, but. Oh, the YFE department, that's Miss Megan. Yeah, I saw a question. <laughs> Someone's asking, why does that do the pupa dance? <laughs> <laughs> right, so it's, it's trying to secure that um, the black stem, um, the black cord to very securely to the silk mat. Yeah, if it were to fall, it would not, and then the adult emerges, it would not make it because the wings will be all wet and the wings would get deformed. Yeah. Now that would be another brain bank. Let's real quick do a pupa dance. All right. <laughs> you can't use your arms. I'm not. <laughs> Very good. We've got some talented dancers here. It's off for TikTok later <laughs> before it gets shut right. down. Yeah. <laughs> so you can see the this is a chrysalis that's just been formed. So it's the way it looks right when it's been formed. It's very vulnerable, hasn't dried yet and hardened all the way. Then it just starts to change as it hardens. Maybe this might be maybe about 30 or 60 minutes later. That one, the skin never fell off. Okay, and then this one is later. You can see it's dry, it's hardened. They are so beautiful. They don't know why they have the gold dots exactly. So you can, can you see um, a little bit of the wing forming through the chrysalis there? You see the, yeah. of the wing a little? On the right hand side, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, and some of them look kind of blue. I don't know why. So they're so beautiful. They all look a little different. And this one was one of the rare ones that I saw outside at my neighbor's house. She had a lot of milkweed in her yard. And one of her um, caterpillars, they it must have crawled about 100, yard, 100 feet away from the milkweed plants and found this stone wall and crawled up it and attached itself. Yeah, we had something like that happen at my house last year. I, I bought a milkweed plant and I thought I had killed it, but apparently a caterpillar had. And then I found one of these uh, chrysalises over on a pokeweed um, plant, like quite a ways away. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, they can walk pretty far. Then, so this was the only one I ever found uh, at my house. It's on the electric box. Oh. <laughs> now, if you uh, if you learn to do this and you try it out, you are going to have some heartbreak along the way because um, there are a lot of paras uh, parasitic flies, tachinid flies, that will um, lay their eggs in the caterpillar's body and kind of eat it from the inside out. And sometimes it will still be able to make it uh, chrysalis, but these things that look like strings hanging down that shows that the fly larva came out and they exit down these strings and then they make their own pupa. So that kills the bus. Um, uh, this is, um, again, I had before that 
Sometimes you have to remove the leaf from the plant if they, uh, the chrysalis is attached to the plant because the, the plant is not staying. You know, once you've cut the plant, you put it in the jug like I showed you, um, it's the only a stay fresh for about a week. And so the leaves are dying. So this is one technique. You can clip the leaf to a string that you tie inside a netted enclosure. And that is um, a technique that my butterfly friend Joanne gave me and uh, that worked really well because they can do their, they can continue, um, they can emerge as adults in there and be safe. You want them to be in a soft enclosure because if they try to fly around in there, remember we learned that they, uh, their scales come off um, if their wings touch anything, especially hard things. So you want to have a soft, like netted enclosure. Also, the netting is very easy for them to climb around on um, with their little feet. So um, the other thing um, that's complicated about monarchs is the ones that are born in the summer do not migrate, and the adults only live two to six weeks. Their their job is just to mate and reproduce and then die. So lay eggs and die. The ones that are uh, where the adults emerge in the late summer and fall, their job is to migrate to Mexico. So they go into reproductive diapause and they don't mate and they don't lay eggs. And they save that energy for the migration because they have to fly hundreds and hundreds of miles. So those little creatures that look so fragile are able to fly hundreds and hundreds of miles to uh, central Mexico. They have a very specific area where is the only place where they can survive the winter in the transvolcanic mountains of central Mexico in the Oyamel fir trees. And one of the main um, uh, risks that they face is the loss of their overwintering habitat and also climate change, which is changing the weather patterns and uh, sometimes causing heavy, heavy rains down there and then a freeze. If they get ice on their bodies as a result, they just, they have massive die-offs. So they can tolerate being cold when they're in that semi-hibernation, but they can't tolerate being covered with ice. So we here in Maryland can't necessarily fix that problem. However, we can try to reduce our carbon footprint so we can reduce climate change. So this is where I started rearing them outdoors instead of inside because these, this was the late summer, early fall um, population that were gonna migrate. So in order for them, this is the latest research and we're, all, we're just always learning more about it. Um, but the latest research was suggesting that if they're gonna migrate, you should rear them outside. Okay, so I hope that the, our viewers will turn in, tune in to see the most amazing thing, which is when they emerge as a butterfly from the chrysalis. So you can see Megan and Dominique, right? You can see the butterfly through the chrysalis and the chrysalis um, starts becoming more transparent too. Yeah. Oh, wow. It's really dark like that. You know it's going to emerge within about um, 30 hours. Sometimes the gold dots actually look green. See some <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Looks like someone wants to know why do they migrate in the summer and not in the winter? Um, so the ones that, so they can't fly when it's uh, below 55 degrees. So they have to start migrating before it gets cold here or else they wouldn't be able to make it. So they start migrating uh, maybe around uh, late August. Um, and any, any butterflies that emerge after late August in this area are definitely going to migrate. Otherwise, they would die. Okay, so this is um, going to be the video, uh, the fast version. Of, it's called E-closing when it actually comes out of the chrysalis. Wow, it's like their wings are growing. <laughs> so do you think their wings are actually growing? It looked that way. So they're, they're being pumped, for, because they've been all cramped up in the little chrysalis, right? They had to be small and they're wet. So 
they start to dry and that the butterfly is a way of pumping the fluid into those black veins to enlarge them. Like pumping up your bike tire. Hmm. Ah, so this is the real time version. I think it's about a minute and a half for it to come out. Mm -hmm. You'll notice that the first thing that comes out is the front legs. Not the little teeny legs, the, the bigger front legs, because it has to hold on to that chrysalis case for dear life. If it were to fall, and it, I, I've had uh, one or two that did fall, um, it could damage its wings. Mm -hmm. Like it's doing its pupa dance again. Um, well, so it's not a pupa now. Right. An adult. So it's sort of rocking back and forth to be able to come out. And you see it will do a somersault. And you saw, said that was called e e-closing? E-closing, yeah, even though it seems like it's opening, the scientific term is e-closing. When know. any insect comes out of its pupa. I think its legs are already out. So it's gripping the outside of the chrysalis case so it won't fall. You look carefully, I think you can see those little teeny front legs moving. Yeah, yeah, I see that in the lower left. I mean, even this is pretty fast, I have to say. Yeah, probably the reason for that is they're very vulnerable to predation during these times. So if they're out in the wild, the best thing is for it to be fast. That's in my kitchen. <laughs> so you see it's grabbing the chrysalis case. Why do you think it's turn rotating like that? Hmm. Uh, I guess it's getting used to its new form, maybe. It's, it's actually trying to dry its wings a little faster. Okay, so you can see the, the proboscis coming out and in. Uh, curling and uncurling and the little front legs. It's actually the proboscis, which is its tongue, is actually in two parts for some reason when it comes out of the chrysalis. And mm -hmm. so it has to sort of zip it together to be one piece. Huh. I also noticed it's looking a little bottom heavy with its abdomen there. Because the wings are so small, it makes its abdomen look, look bigger. Uh, but I think the fluid, may, maybe the fluid is in the abdomen, and so when it pumps the fluid in the wings, there's less fluid in the abdomen. Mm. So it takes about 15 minutes for the wings to uh, straighten out. But then it depends a lot on the weather as to how, when is it actually ready to fall. So I'm going to skip ahead a little. You can see the proboscis there. You know, the proboscis only comes out when, normally when it's going to actually feed, but right there it's, it's just, I think it's still in the process of sewing it together or zipping it together. So it's normal for a little bit of that orange liquid to come out. That's normal. That's an empty chrysalis case. Um, once they're adults, or well, when you have them in containers, if, again, you need to know what you're doing and <laughs> you need to have some training or read about it a lot before you try it. But uh, I was able to take the, uh, them to school. And of course, the students love it. It's like someone wants to know why doesn't it put the chrysalis on the ground after it emerges from it? Um, so once the adult butterfly emerges from the chrysalis, it doesn't need the chrysalis anymore. It just needs for, uh, as soon as its wings are dry, it just needs to fly away. So the chrysalis has done its job, but the chrysalis should never really be on the ground uh, because um, before the butterfly emerges, because as I said, the wings would not be able to form properly if it's on the ground. Mm -hmm. It has to be hanging, so then it's, the wings are just surrounded by air. These pictures of my students, and then we took them outside. We're very lucky. We have a um, we have rain gardens outside of the school that the uh, Patterson Park branch of the Enoch Pratt Free Library um, 
uh, there's a not well not just the library but the community around it uh, worked with a bunch of nonprofits like Blue Water Baltimore and saw these rain gardens and native plants. That's in the library. And then I trained this librarian on how to uh, make sure that it comes out of the crystals correctly and release, she released them with library patrons. And they kept, they kept the container on the, the circulation desk so everybody could see. So it's really um, a wonderful feeling to just let it flutter off your hand. So sometimes when it's new, it will just fly a little bit, perch somewhere close to the ground. But when the wings are really dry, um, it's been waiting a while, it will go whoosh, whoosh, right straight up. I think someone's asking why we need training or why we need, why you need to be trained. Good job. Um, well, because there's a lot of ways that you could actually hurt them or, or introduce disease into the population if you don't care, care for them properly. And so when in doubt, it's better just to sort of let nature take its course. And if you're not sure how to raise them then or rear them, the best thing is just to increase the native plants in your yard because that way you're increasing the habitat. Now, some people who get a, even more training do something called tagging. And so monarchwatch.org is an organization at the University of Kansas that um, you can get these tags or these little tiny round stickers that have been approved. Um, and they each have a, a unique number and you order them in advance and then you keep a log of when you tag them and where and whether it was male or female, where you released it. It allows, um, it allows for to, uh, tracking to occur. So then that number goes into a database. And if somebody finds, say that sticker again, uh, maybe the butterfly made it to Mexico and somebody down there finds that, um, then they can document you know, where it went, how it migrated and so on. So it, it's a citizen science project. I personally did not feel comfortable doing this because I feel like I'm gonna hurt uh, the butterfly, but um, if you do it correctly, they say that it doesn't hurt it. So there's one that uh, there was a lady who used to have these demos where they tag them up at um, the Ag Center up in Hunt Valley. Um, I don't know if she's doing it now with the virus, but um, she used to raise men at, at her house and then do demos where she showed people how to put the stickers on. And that's from Ancient Roots. So you can see that little blue star in Mexico is the overwintering grounds for the ones that are born in the late summer and fall here. Now, the confusing thing to a lot of people is the ones that migrate to Mexico are not the same ones that come, they do not come all the way back to Maryland because they can't live that long. They come back to the Gulf states and lay their eggs and then their children come further north and then their children come further north until finally the generation uh, that reaches us in Maryland is here. Oh, wow, that's interesting. Um, so just real quick before we close, uh, what can you do if you don't want uh, to actually learn to rear them? Uh, plant milkweed and other native plants in your yard. This is a really popular one, it's called butterfly weed. Not to be confused with butterfly bush, which is a non-native plant, but this one is a milkweed, butterfly weed. So uh, the adult butterflies can find nectar from the flowers and they can lay their eggs on the leaves. And this is swamp milkweed, which is taller. And this is the common milkweed, which is uh, once it gets established, will pop up everywhere. <laughs> so if you don't want uh, it to pop up everywhere, don't plant this one, but uh, this one has really big leaves. So it provides lots of food for the caterpillar. Uh, and then a book I recommend, a uh, picture book, is called Monarch Come Play With Me and by Ba Ray. It's got very realistic um, illustrations and it gives you a lot more, a lot of facts about the metamorphosis. Oh, uh, Miss Adrian, I just wanted to mention, I, I checked a little earlier in preparation for today and there is, I found two places nearby, one of which it apparently does carry both both Maryland native butterfly milkweed that you were just mentioning, 
and the swamp milkweed. They have those. Um, so if anyone's interested, that was uh, Chesapeake Valley Seed, chesapeakevalleyseed.com. And I did verify with them that it is specifically native. Yeah, and you also want them to guarantee you that, that plants have not been treated uh, systemically with uh, pesticides, because then you end up actually poisoning the, the insects that you're trying to support. And also Herring Run Nursery is a great source. Um, I assume that everything is uh, uh, remote, being done remotely at this point. I'm not sure the delivery system. So this is another book if, if the library um, wants, has the funds or wants to carry it. It's got my ESOL sticker on it because I took it to school. <laughs> I'll just check and see if we have that in our system yet. So um, I have some more pictures, but I, we're, uh, I gave you a lot of information and um, I don't want to oversaturate you, so we could call it a program if you want. Do we have any more questions? Whoops. I think I don't see any more in the Q&A. Do you, Dominique? Uh, no new ones. All of them looks like they're answered, so. Okay. And here are some oh, things that I put together. When, oh, okay, this one's interesting. When in M or, okay, when are male or female determined? Okay, not sure about that one. Hmm. Oh, when, oh, so at some point, um, yeah, when did they develop their gender? Like at what stage in their larval stage? I would assume probably when they're young caterpillars. There is a way to, uh, to determine the gender of the caterpillar, but only through dissection, which I don't <laughs> recommend because it would kill it. So, um, yeah. That is wonderful. Well, so here are some links as well. Monarchjointventure.org, Journey North. These are good reputable sites. Uh, again, there is debate in the butterfly rearing community. Some people say, never rear them inside. Or some people say, never tag them. You know, and then others say, yes, you can. And so uh, I think it's really just like, we are lifelong learners in the library field and we're always learning more. And if you don't, uh, don't want to actually touch them and try to rear them, just observe them. And there's um, free apps like iNaturalist app that I have on my phone where you could take a picture of um, any insect or plant and that you see and then upload it to that and it will tell you what it is and then you can also share it and tell where you saw it and what time and um, it provides more data so that uh, the scientists the more data the scientists have the more they can understand the behavior of the, the creatures and the insects and then we can do a better job of helping them to survive. I think we had one last question um, about getting a, a list of these resources. And Dominique, I think we should be able to email the participants, right? Maybe with a- oh, Of course, I don't see why not. Cool. Thanks, Reese and Riley, for that question. See okay, well, if there are any other, if there are no other questions, um, we really do appreciate Miss Adrian coming out. We um, we really hope that she'll come to at least the Perry Hall branch um, next year when things are a little uh, calmer. That would be a fantastic uh, program to see in person. But I have to say, her her videos and her um, up close photos have just really made it feel like we were right there. So again, thank you to Miss Miss Adrian. And uh, thanks to the Friends of the Perry Hall Library for sponsoring this great event. And thank you, Dominique, for, you know, just being an awesome production expert. <laughs> thank you all for having me and for tuning in. Thank you so much. I hope to see you again. And we hope to post this um, uh, recording, if all goes well. Uh, so look for a link either on um, the library's Facebook or, um, or website. Yep, or the, the YouTube page, page too. Or oh yes, or the YouTube page, most likely that. Awesome. Excellent.
Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thank you.